Welcome everybody to uh, this session that is about uh, cloud events. Uh, we're going to talk about um, cloud events. I'm going to give you an introduction and a why, what we did, what we didn't do intentionally, because that's also important. Um, and I will um, then hand off to uh, some of my colleagues here, uh, Klaus, Doug, and Vladimir, who will then talk about um, cloud events in production after I also presented what we do at Microsoft. I'm, my name is Clemens Fastas. I am a principal architect at Microsoft, and I'm the architect for the messaging platform um, in Azure. Um, we have various products there, and uh, I'm also leading our standardization um, efforts um, around messaging, and cloud events is one of the things that I do there. Cloud events, so what we're going to talk about history, we're going to have a nice demo. Um, I'm going to talk about the, um, the plans, some of the plans that we have uh, that we talked about yesterday, uh, what we might do. There's no decision about this yet, and we are certainly open for further participation. And then, as I said, we're going to have some um, real production um, showcases, um, including some announcements, maybe. Um, the cloud events effort was something that started um, as a exploration you know, between a few companies, um, figuring whether the, it would make sense to have the concept of event standardized, um, whether it would make sense to have a common notion of that, uh, because we've seen in many event-driven applications in various clouds um, different formats, and different formats in the sense of um, even within a single cloud, a different notion of what the type of an event is and what an idea of an event is and what the timestamp is and what, what things are named, how they're transported. So we decided it would be a good, sense, a good idea to harmonize that. So there was a, um, the Technical Over Oversight Com Committee initiated that then as an effort based on input um, from various participation, participating companies, IBM, Google, Microsoft, others. And uh, we then started to um, on this journey to uh, work on this. We overall, I think we had over 30 companies um, represented in the effort. And um, I am on standard committees quite a bit. And uh, the fact that we had, you know, by average, I would say 25 people on the call every week um, is uh, remarkable for something that just deals with, you know, protocol standardization. That is something that I personally have not seen um, yet, that level of engagement, both from, a, from the um, customer community as well as from the platform community. So um, what is it? It is um, an eventing protocol suite um, in, the, in the effect. Um, you'll see that we're not defining something new, but we're actually leveraging existing protocols. Um, they generally, we have a set of base protocols that we use in, in enterprise systems and uh, in um, you know, systems of all kinds um, that is fairly popular and fairly established, and we didn't want to add a new protocol. Right? Harmonization doesn't mean that you need to go and add new protocols, but there are, there's a family of protocols that exists um, that everybody's fairly happy with. So there's HTTP, there's MQTT, there's MQP, um, and we also have... Um, uh, Nats and Kafka, and those are the most popular protocols um, uh, that are out there. And instead of doing something that is completely new, we decided that we want to go and build something that integrates with those existing options. Um, and we also said, you know, everybody's using JSON today, um, so we want to make a first-class JSON experience, obviously, for formatting those events. But it's also clear that there are new, more performant, better type system options out there. So we wanted to make the system pluggable in that way. So before I get into further details, let's, let's talk about why cloud events makes um, sense. In today's systems that are getting more complicated, more complicated, more complicated, events take a journey. They start. If we look at an IoT solution, they start at some device. Um, and some device, actually, if that device is a machine, then the story already is fairly complicated because you have a drive that is inside of a component that is inside of a machine 
that is inside of a cell that is on the shop floor in a factory. So you already have five levels of you know, event routing that happen there until that gets into the factory level, and then it goes, it goes out and goes to further stages. So we see more and more, and if you look at solutions that you, you might be building or your customers might be building, we see these chains of event flows. An event gets sent, gets put into, let's say, an event stream broker like Kafka or Event Hubs, um, maybe gets pushed into a function, but then the event propagates from there. It gets stored, it gets more aggregated, um, but often those event streams get pushed into multiple directions, are, are evaluated in different ways and they traverse multiple different protocols. It starts its life being put on the wire over MQTT, then gets uh, pushed over into um, Kafka or into AMQP, and then gets pushed further and maybe ends up in HTTP. And that's the reality of life under the covers in the protocol landscape. And it doesn't make any sense to start, to, to start inventing yet another one. But we want to make sure that that event that originates over there on that device gets lands in the same shape um, in storage for batch analysis later. So that was one of the motivations. Events are not just raised here, ca caught here, but they actually take a journey through a system. Um, and so how can we go and accomplish that? So what um, Cloud Events does is that it, as said, binds to existing protocols and it does so via um, encodings. So we have a, a cloud event is really a data structure. It's an information set, as you would say that in parlance of um, uh, older encoding formats. And um, you have event data. That's the core information that you want to go and carry, that you want to express to someone else. Um, you have context attributes that describe what that data is so that the infrastructure the event broker can go and see it, and then can go and, and handle it, can go fil apply filtering, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are user extensions and custom extensions that you may add to the event, also to make visible to infrastructure, to intermediaries, so they can go and handle the event. So the basic idea here is, is like with messaging everywhere else, the event data is your payload that you decide what the format is, you decide what the encoding is, you decide everything about this. And then you declare on, effectively on the outside of that a set of attributes that say, that, that make statements about that event, including custom um, extensions. Um, and as I said, it tries to leverage the existing world instead of creating something new. The base specification that we have um, defines just what the attribute set is. We have um, a set of co context attributes and we have a set of rules. There's a bit of philosophy at the start, um, a set of rules for what the context attributes are, what their role is, and um, they are um, designed so that generic infrastructure can go and reason about the event. And that you can go and create diagnostics, traces, that you can go and, and you know, describe the journey of that event through the system and you have enough information without having to know what's inside of that event data. So there is first information about what is the type of that event. So spec version refers to the version of cloud events, which is 1.0 now, and which we hope will not change for quite a while. Um, and then the second is the type, and the type describes what that event is. Um, that might, for instance, be Microsoft.storage.blob created. That is the kind of event that's being raised, and that tells you that in the Microsoft storage system there was a blob created. Um, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of event. Of course, for every system, you can go and create your own event types, endless event types, and what we've said that we um, have a you know, convention that those event types should be formulated with reverse DNS notation. Then we have the notion of when it was sent. That's time in, um, in UTC format. We have a context from which it was sent out of. There's a source, which is the URI, which describes generally the party that has been emitting the event or also the party you have been subscribing to. And then there's a subject which identifies 
the item inside of that context about, that, about which that event is. So if you, for instance, are subscribing to a storage container in a cloud storage system, and you say, please give me information about when new uh, files or blobs are being created or deleted, then that's your source. And then the subject actually describes the concrete file um, which is um, about which that event is. That's a split between source and subject. Um, then there's a unique identifier for the event, so we can just distinguish uh, one instance from the other. Um, and then there is um, information that is on the frame about the event data that's inside of the event, which is the data content type, which maps to um, content to the proper content type header in HTTP. Um, when you use the binary encoding, as we call it, I'll get to that in a second. And then there is a schema, actually data schema typo. There's a data schema field which allows you to put a URL into a URI into the um, event, which points to some external schema that you can then go use fetch to go and decode the data that is uh, inside of it or where you can get some in semantic information about it. Um, that schema is optional, you don't have to use it, but it's something that we thought makes sense to go and um, standardize. The event data can be anything, I said, so the event data can be any binary, can be any encoding, we don't, the, the system doesn't, um, or, and the implementations don't take any, don't take a look into the payload, they don't have any rules around it. Um, what's important is to, and th now we're getting to the dis differentiation somewhat between events and messages, um, is what events are. Because if you look at, so, I mean, if you look at this, and you think of that as a messaging standard, eventing messaging standard, and you're familiar with existing messaging products, you'll find some things missing. And that's quite intentional. So we have a, there's some philosophy behind this. Events are expressions of facts, right? You tell someone about something that just happened. Messages are um, a, events are somewhat special types of messages, if you will, but messages are um, carrying commands, they have intents, they create a coupling between two parties, right? You send someone a job to do, and then that means only one party can get it, that means that you may want to get a reply when that, job, when that job is done. You're creating a more complicated relationship between two parties. Events have none of that. Events, you basically just raise the, the information about a particular fact, and then whoever subscribes to that event, whoever can get it, whoever can get it, obtain a copy of it, can go and react to it. That's a very different concept, even though principally, right, they're both messages. So we've, we've focused very, very specifically on the event on telemetry or on alerts or on you know, other statements of fact. We didn't, we scoped out all the complexity of you know, multi-party relationships. Because that ends up being much harder to model with all the transports that we have. That makes the whole story much harder because now you need to have, you need to explain what the, what the relationships are. So cloud events is about eventing. You raise an event from a publisher, you can go and put that into an intermediary, the intermediary will go and broadcast that information further, and then you have subscribers at the end. Some information that is in interesting for multiple parties in the system, basically. That is the intent behind cloud events. It's enabling publish subscribe. What's missing is are contracts like to, reply to, topics, cues, any of those things. Because they create these kinds of relationships. If I have a reply to, and I'm sending a message over, I'm publishing an event and I'm sending that over HTTP, and now that gets transposed into AMQP, that gets transposed into MQTT, gets, gets sent into um, a, uh, you know, fenced off VPN environment. And now there's a reply to address in there that is, you know, whatever, MQP, an MQP address. How do you reach back? 
That's a hard problem, and so therefore we, we said, let's not boil the ocean, let's not make the same mistakes that earlier standards have made, made and try to make the universal messaging solution, but let's just focus on that problem of, of what an event is. And that's why you don't find those things here. So, further down into the details, what is an event format? An event format is um, effectively the information model. Uh, sorry, there's an information model, and the event format renders that information model for the wire. We have uh, three of these, uh, of these uh, event formats. We have JSON, that's the default, and we also support Avro, and we support um, also AMQP. And the model is, is completely pluggable, and uh, if someone were to come and uh, create an event format for message pack, or for Seabor, or for any of the other things, we would happily go and be adding this as an extension to the repo, um, and it's just that nobody has done the work yet. But the goal is that we, you can use effectively every kind of encoding. Um, there's a, there was a pre protobuf encoding in here, but that was pulled out because they, um, in the end, the, the protobuf uh, team wasn't happy with it, and they were gonna rework it and recontribute it, so we're gonna have effectively encodings that are compact, and that um, express um, cloud events correctly uh, in all of those forms. A cloud event then is bound to a transport. And here's the example for HTTP. We have a binary event, and what you see is that the binary event, um, you know, that's just a normal HTTP post, so that's not, not, not very uh, exciting. The way how, so the binary means the event payload is just your payload, and what Cloud Events adds here is now the metadata information. So now we have some common information, the common information is expressed as HTTP headers with a CE-prefix. So spec version, type, source, ID. And when you go and you know, take, it, take that request and you filter out all, everything that's with CE- you also get all the custom extensions. So if someone creates an event with a custom extension, you know, any property that they want, that will gets prefixed with CE dash, which means you pick up the event in your code and you take everything that's prefixed with CE dash and you'll have your, your uh, cloud events metadata. That's how we map that. And then we have a self-contained model and that's the structured format. The structured format basically has all the information inside of it, so all the metadata is uh, inside of um, and an object in this case for JSON um, that are, then has all the definitions and then that also has the data then inlined. And the data here, um, we have that cost us quite a bit of uh, uh, discussions. Um, the data here can also contain binary. So if it's um, JSON, then, and it has a data content type that, is, that indicates a binary type, then that will be base64 encoded. And we have a special es escape effectively. You have a data underscore base64 that clearly indicates that the data is base64 encoded. So you can carry then base64. If you use Avro, then it's not, it's not nearly as complicated because Avro simply has a binary field as the um, content for data. So, so Avro will be much more uh, efficient, but Avro is uh, harder to write down on a slide. So the, the options that we have is HTTP 1.1 and with that also HTTP 2, HTTP 3. Because what we've done here is we've, we took effectively this cloud event, we mapped that onto the message structure that is defined by, um, and the semantics that is defined by RFC 32, uh, 7231. So 7230 is the spec that defines how HTTP 1.1 looks on the wire. And 7231 is the spec that, that talks about what the message model is of HTTP independent of this, and the, the trick that HTTP does and HTTP 2, 3 do, do is they take that spec and map that onto, onto a brand new protocol, um, either the HTTP 2 protocol or, or QUIC um, in the case of HTTP 3. So we've effectively done, we've, we're layering on top of that semantic model and that's how we bind these. Um, our, our binding is not specific to get or set, or uh, you know, push, uh, put or post or, or anything. So it's basically just mapping the message. Um, MQP, we're binding to the MQP 1.0 um, standard. We're binding to MQTT, we're binding to NATS, and we're binding to Apache Kafka. 
and uh, the SDKs that we have as part of the project, um, most of them provide implementations for all of those and uh, where there are gaps, they will be closed. Things that we didn't do um, are, um, and we haven't tackled yet, are signatures, end-to-end -end encryption, any of these things, because um, some of us have, have worked on prior efforts, like um, the older of us have worked on things like W security um, with the soap stack, and uh, there the security stuff sunk the ship like a stone. And uh, so that was not a good idea to start with that. We will eventually probably get to it, but um, it was a good idea to scope that out because we have TLS to start with, and that's not a bad start overall. So we didn't want to um, you know, make things too complicated. So it's, V1 was approved uh, last month. Um, the incubator status with, it was approved last month. So you can go and take that spec, you can take the SDKs um, and can start using them now. Um, we have no intention to go fast and rev and you know, create a 1.1 one, one version and a 2.0 version very soon. Um, if, um, I, I certainly want to go and touch that spec for another year, um, at least, um, and, uh, and, and, le and, and more if possible, because the goal for, here, for this is to have stability. We will do extensions, and we have an extensibility model, but the goal is for that to be stable. Um, so what's next? We have now a format. We have ways to map onto protocol. We have a webhook definition for how this can be used together with webhooks, together with a protection mechanism. So we have a, a protocol foundation. One of the things we haven't, haven't solved yet, for instance, is how we're going to do subscriptions, because it's a pop-sub model. So how can we find out who is offering which events? How can I go and initiate a subscription to it? And how are we going to go, go and make that work with a polyglot world where you have not only HTTP, but also have other protocols? So, so finding out how that might work is something that we talked about yesterday um, as an extension to cloud events, and then certainly the security aspects um, and uh, also schema management, et cetera. Uh, might be interesting areas, and uh, if you are interested in participating in that, you're certainly invited to come. So, now demo. Um, I'm going to show you the airport demo, and that is with audience participation. So, if you would um, point your phone to the screen and uh, get, the, um, get that code, I will give you another 10 seconds. All right, so then uh, let's see whether anything happens. Ah, look, they're all trying to get uh, coffee already. Oh, you, oops, we can see it? Oh, what do I have to do? Oh my god, hang on, here we go. Ah! So, so what, so, so what you're all doing? I see K Native is very popular. So you're all trying to get K Native coffee. I see. So what this does effectively is a little simulation that's based on an air that's that's based on a, on a fairly serious airport scenario, where you have uh, suppliers up here, warehouses who have coffee and cups, and then you have have uh, um, you know, transport logistics companies which go and carry those things. And as you order um, coffee, uh, there is some certain stock in the stores, and uh, those that stock is then being um, replenished. This then being reported, hey, I'm out of I'm out of coffee coffee mugs, and uh, that then gets reported out uh, into the warehouses. The warehouses then say, yep, your order is ready. Then the car comes, and all of this. so we're doing all this with cloud events. So when we look at this, I can go and pick, like here's an order. Um, that's the order status. The order has been, that order has now been released uh, from the retailer. So we have uh, been um, you know, selling that. Then we have, um, you know, oh, that's the same one. So, but the, the amazing thing about this is, um, you see that there are um, all kinds of different participants. So the, in the back of this is a message broker. That message broker speaks MQP and has a topic. 
and uh, everybody's publishing to that thing, um, cloud events, and then there are subscribers which show up um, from all the various companies, and this is using the Knative stack, this, that is using um, the, what's that, the Oracle function stack, um, that is um, using, the, that's using some of the stuff that we built, um, and is using, um, help me, the SAP, yes, and uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's what it is. And um, so I, I didn't, I'm not good with logos. So, and that's a, that's a fairly, that was a fairly amazingly complicated thing. And we put this together in, you know, if you just count, if you just count the time that it took people to go and implement it, it took, you know, a few, maybe two days or so. Um, and then, you know, it was more asynchronous because not everybody has time at the same time. You know how that goes. But it went, it was mostly flawless. Because we had agreed on something, we have SDKs that we can all use, and so this is a multi-cloud solution where um, the, the UI is hosted by IBM, and uh, Doug did most of the work um, for all the wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, um, uh, visualizations, and then all the other participants are in various clouds, and uh, it all uh, works really wonderfully together. So that's a, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful little showcase of uh, how the interoperability works. So, that was that. Now we come to the next section, and before everybody gets nervous, I'm gonna hand off soon. Um, cloud events and production. So, some folks have cloud events. So we just got done, uh, as I said, what? three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Um, but there is already production news. Uh, and since I'm already talking, um, I will be talking about what we do at Microsoft. Um, and I have one slide and a bit of a demo for it. So we have EventGrid. Azure EventGrid is our universal pub-sub engine that is part of the Azure cloud. And um, what it is is, is is a broker that is a push, push, push broker that allows you to publish events subscribe to them, and we will go and push into particular um, uh, different um, you know, destinations. So you can go and push to a queue, and then you have more like a, pub, um, like a, a classic pops up system, but you can also push into uh, you know, an event, event ingester, you can push into uh, logic apps for workflow, you can push into a storage queue, you can push into any webhook, you can push into an um, Azure function, um, so you can go effectively raise events and then you can go and have them routed to either messaging destinations or destinations where you can go and do compute on, based on them. That exists in two forms. There's event grid in the cloud, which exists in all data, Azure data centers. Um, and there's event uh, grid on IoT Edge now, which is something that we just, prob uh, just released a few weeks ago. Um, IoT Edge is a containerized um, cloud-managed environment um, for um, IoT uh, devices or IoT gateways. And so Grid also exists in that now. That is not Kubernetes-based, and uh, you should expect that that little event grid on IoT Edge, um, which is a containerized uh, Linux workload, will eventually go and grow out of that little container that is in, in um, IoT Edge and will also you know, go elsewhere. But we have effectively, a, 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 we have an Edge offering and we have a cloud offering and those things also integrate with each other. Now, that speaks completely cloud events now. So everything that is an event that's being raised in the Azure platform, you can now subscribe to as a cloud event. So we have had a, a previously we had this, a different standard format which we have given to all the teams that they should go and, and uh, 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 adhere to. And uh, we have now effectively a, a mapping that we've done where we make all of those events available as Cloud Events 1.0. And um, now we, um, uh, our, we have been switching to Cloud Events 1.0 as our primary protocol. So everything in the Azure Cloud that is eventing um, will now be Cloud Events 1.0. Um, and just to show you that briefly, um, I have a, um, here's my portal. I have a file store here, so that's in the Azure portal. Um, in, in my file store, so this is a storage account, 
where I can go and store files. Um, and here's a, my event co uh, configuration. So here you can go and add event subscriptions um, to a storage account. And what you'll do is, so you see that event grid is actually a feature of the respective uh, platform features. So go and create an event subscription. Um, and you can see here, I can give that thing a name. That's funny. Foo. And here you can now select the cloud event schema, and then you're going to get cloud events pushed to you with the full, with the webhook specification uh, compliance, which, which means also including the pre-validation hook. Um, I have already created that for you, so I'm going to abandon this, and I'm going to um, have this rule here. I set this up, and I have a little app that I'm running here, and that app is using the, the Azure Relay, um, which means this is an ASP.NET server application that runs on this machine and it projects out a listener endpoint into the Azure cloud. So the endpoint that we're going to hit is in the Azure cloud and then the request gets, gets down, pushed to this machine. So, um, and we're going to do this with this tool because we have now created a trigger on when a blob has been created on that storage account. So when we create a new blob, when we upload a file, then that should be triggered. So I'm going to go and say, Oh, not, not, oops. And sorry for that being German. I'm uploading a file, that's what that says. Uh, I'm gonna just pick a picture from my collection here. And you'll see that I just got that event. Hang on, here. That is, we have a new blob, a new blob was put, a new blob was uploaded, uploaded, and I could now go and, and act on that event and say, you know, push that new file into um, a, you know, cognitive services thing for, for, categor for categor categorization. I could go and recode it. I can basically go and turn that now into a picture library. All right, and that is what I had for you from Microsoft, so everything um, in Azure is now cloud events enabled, and next is clouds. Okay, so I have brought some um, presentation about a use case that is quite important to us at SAP. Oh, uh, presentation mode. Uh, let me do that. Go. Okay, so in a, a use case that is important to us at SAP, and oops, that is the wrong direction, that one. So the use case is uh, extensibility. So as you might know, um, SAP's business is around um, business solutions, and in um, software as a service applications, uh, customers still want to have their own special things and uh, want to extend it with their own logic. They, they may need some uh, additional validations. All those things are, as, as not, no two businesses are really alike. And yeah, so that's done via extensibility. And um, those extensions, of course, need to know whenever they have to get active. They need to be triggered somehow. And that's done via business events. So in our case, these really have some, some business uh, semantics. Um, and uh, so they're not as technical, uh, it's really something happening in the business in this case. And um, the other direction then is API calls. I guess that's quite common. But this is the overarching scheme also over the next slides. So you have always events and APIs. And um, how this now looks like in uh, SAP, <coughs> we provide this um, cloud platform extension factory. And that is then the job to um, wire extensions together with all of our um, applications. Um, we have different runtimes uh, where you can um, provide extensions. Um, depends on the flavor you uh, prefer. So there is the, the Kima runtime, which is based on an open source project on, on Kubernetes. Um, we have a serverless runtime, basically functions, and uh, also application runtime, it's called here. It's basically a, a Cloud Foundry. And also our classic programming language uh, called ABAP. 
And all of this is running on different uh, infrastructure providers. That's also important because some more <laughs> interoperability is needed. We, we run actually on, on, on Google, on Azure, and um, AWS, and uh, um, many more actually. Also, we have our own um, data centers. So, and yeah, on the left hand side, you have a lot of, see a lot of different applications. And that brings me actually to the next slide. So, what is our advantage of using cloud events? And um, interoperability is the first that comes to mind. And for us, already internally to SAP, um, interoperability is really important as we have all those applications, some of them originating from uh, companies that got acquired and uh, developed by different teams all around the world. So um, to, to really have events from all of those applications uh, handled the same way is a real advantage for us. And as I mentioned, if the infrastructure provider, as we have seen before, uh, is also using cloud events, that's of course uh, another interesting advantage. Um, standardization brings not only interoperability for us, it's also helping us to provide um, consistent tooling. There might be open source tools. I mean, we have already the SDKs in our own project, but we can also be, uh, we are also able to uh, write our own very specific tools for our developers. Um, and developers uh, who come and extend SAP software can um, also uh, then might already know cloud events even though they might not be really accustomed to uh, any uh, SAP specific things. So this open standard here is really uh, an advantage. And last but not least, um, the eventing infrastructure. We only have to provide one eventing infrastructure for our applications. And, and so essentially, you could say that a unification here also saves us money. And so one example from an actual application where we use cloud events, this application is uh, called subscription billing. And it's about, um, and yeah, so actually our customers can handle their customers' subscriptions in there. So um, that's what the event is telling, and a subscription has been created. Um, you can see uh, the typical um, attributes you have already seen also in Clement's presentation. And I'd like to um, um, bring your attention to those two fields, type and source, as in my experience it was it is a bit well challenging in the beginning to to find the right um, schemes how to really use those. So uh, for type it might still be uh, pretty clear. You have usually those reverse DNS notations as we have also here. Maybe also some some version attached to it. But for source, I mean it, the standard just says uh, URI or your reference. And um, what we did now for the beginning at least is that we used this uh, URN form and put in there uh, a part of what we also have in the topics of our messaging service as it already identifies the participants in messaging for us. And in this case, that was pretty good match also for the source and eventing. Um, yeah, in the bottom you see that there's actually not much data in that event, um, but there's enough to, again, in the beginning I said APIs and, AP and events there's enough to use APIs and get more information from the application or do updates. So one example um, from our messaging. So our messaging supports several uh, protocols. We have MQP, we have MQTT, and uh, also as webhooks are really quite common, we also support HTTP. And a real example, I mean, a combination of technologies that <coughs> might occur we have an application that emits an event in MQTT, and uh, then you might have a, a function um, that uh, wants to act upon that event. So we have a message trigger, and the trigger receives that event over AMQP and triggers the function using HTTP. So we already use uh, three different protocol bindings in this rather simple use case, and that's really an advantage to have this already defined in a consistent way. Another place where we use cloud events is in functions. The demo for this you actually saw already uh, before because I, I took this source code from my function I wrote for our supplier you could see in the demo before. Um, so we already added uh, the cloud event attributes to the signature of the function so that the function uh, developer can um, just use those fields without further um, doing any protocol specific, specific things. 
And um, yeah, so you see, I, I did this uh, switch statement for the type and also looked at source and subject in some cases. And um, also you, in the function, you can then just send a, an event without uh, really dealing with uh, protocol. That's in this case doing this, the functions runtime for you. So and for someone who, who likes to uh, do a bit more complex things or to do it in a, in a more uh, open way on, on Kubernetes, uh, we have Project Kima, and um, so this is an open source project. Everybody can can download it and install it on any uh, Kubernetes cluster. Um, internally, we would of course run it on our own uh, um, infrastructure called Gardener. Um, you can, by the way, learn more about those two projects, Gardener and Kima, at our booth. I think for the next hours at least. Um, so in, in um, Kima, there's also a lot of uh, open standards that are applied and, and open source projects. Some of them also from CNCF. And um, yeah, so it's, it's really also built around Knative and um, making excessive use of open service broker API and uh, service catalog and those things. And um, putting together all those uh, separate projects to, to provide a bit less technical or more convenient way to build extensions in this open uh, Kubernetes-based environment. So what did we learn so far um, from using cloud events? So one thing is that maybe um, existing messaging infrastructure has, uh, usually, is usually working on things like topics to work efficiently. And a lot of those off-the-shelf products you have in there um, have some limitations for those topics, like, for example, the topic length uh, being around 250 bytes or th something like this, or uh, only allowing special characters in there. And <coughs> so doing this routing, <coughs> sorry, based on these um, um, off-the-shelf products um, is a bit of a challenge. The, I showed you before that we have um, chosen parts of what we had already in the topic um, for the uh, source. And that was exactly because we wanted to, to use uh, this uh, infrastructure. And for now, we are going for a concatenation, basically, of source and type when we're doing this internally. And um, that brings me to this other point. I think if you start uh, using cloud events or defining them for your uh, organization, uh, you should think carefully about source and type to make it consistent throughout your organization. In our case, it will hopefully, in some case, be dozens or even hundreds of event types over all applications. So um, we thought carefully, I think. <laughs> and um, yes, very specific experience, JMS and cloud events doesn't really fit well, as JMS is an API standard and doesn't really uh, um, define what, what's the outcome on the wire. Um, of course, if you, if you um, rely on a specific JMS driver, then uh, it might work. But uh, if you want to have this portability of JMS, then uh, it doesn't really work well with cloud events, as um, you can't really rely on what is on the wire, and, and that's what cloud events finally does with the protocol bindings. So yes, we had some discussions already in the working group yesterday and uh, about what we are doing in the future from, from our side. After those experiences, we would be happy to look more into subscriptions and event catalogs. And um, yeah, with this, I hand over to Doug. Oh. All right, thank you, Klaus. All right, so I'm going to talk about Knative, a um, little bit of IBM in there, but mainly about Knative. Even though I suspect most of you already know what Knative is, just in case there's some of you that don't, uh, you can think of Knative as a simplified developer experience on top of Kubernetes that has two main components to it, serving for obviously hosting applications, but then it also has an eventing component, which of course is why we're talking about cloud events. So what Knative does in terms of leveraging cloud events is it basically normalizes all the events coming into the system and turns them into cloud events. And it does this mainly so that you can do everything that you guys already talked about, which is process the events without actually having to understand the, the, the business logic within the event, right? Because if you can normalize it into HTTP, into a cloud event format, then you can have all this middleware inside of um, Knative process it without having to be specialized code for every single type of event, every type of, of format that came in and stuff like that. 
So let's look at a very concrete example here in terms of what's available inside of Canadian eventing. So let's say <clears throat> you have an event producer, and what Canadian allows you to do, or helps you do, is actually subscribe to the producer. You could say, go subscribe to, say, GitHub for me. I want all events related to pull requests and stuff like that. It will subscribe for you, and then create what they call an adapter to actually receive the events coming in. And it's that adapter that will convert it into a cloud event. Now, you can then have the adapter send on the message to your service, and that's just fine. That's the easy case. Your service may or may not care that it's a cloud event. Um, if it's sent in that binary format that Clemens talked about, you may not even notice the HTTP headers in there, which means your existing uh, webhook for GitHub will still just work just fine. But if for some reason that consistent metadata is useful to you, you can use it. No big deal. However, they also have this notion of brokers. So if you tell uh, Knative to send the event not directly to your service but to a broker, that allows you to start to do some fan out and a little bit of orchestration of the events. So what you can do is have your service subscribe to the broker through a trigger. Now, the broker may have some persistence in there, maybe in memory, that's kind of up to you, that's not the point. But the point here is that you can have multiple people subscribe to the broker so you get that fan out mechanism. Now, the trigger is a subscription which can take a filter mechanism, and you can filter on the cloud event metadata. So what this means is you could technically have a broker that subscribes to a, a, a producer like GitHub and asks for basically all events on an entire organization or repo. But then you down at the service level when you subscribe to the trigger, that you can actually say, oh, I only want on this particular service to get in, uh, events about pull requests, another one to get information about events. The, so the trigger can do that filtering based upon cloud event metadata, the type field in particular, or the source field if you actually subscribe to more than one GitHub org, right? And that trigger can get its job done without knowing anything about the event itself, meaning that it came from GitHub, what the syntax from GitHub looks like or anything. All it has to know is basically regular expression type processing on the cloud event metadata, okay? So that's a, that's a huge benefit right there because now we can, we can start to produce generic infrastructure for managing events without understanding the business logic. Just to complete the picture though, when the service, or if the service has a reply, you can also tell the broker to send it on to someplace else, some other sync. And just mention that for something later on. Now, they also have other types of tools in the toolbox in terms of how to manage and orchestrate these events. In this particular case, they have something called Parallel, which you can think of sort of like a fan out. One event comes in, gets sent to multiple conditions. If a condition passes, then it gets sent onto the sync associated with the condition. Well, that condition is basically a filtering mechanism. Now, in this particular case, though, it's actually running a container, so you could do a very complex filtering thing if you want, but you can also filter on cloud events if you don't want to understand the actual business logic. Okay, so another place where the abstraction helps us. And finally, again, just to sort of complete the picture, for those of you who don't know about Knative, there's also this thing called Sequence, which has nothing to do with cloud events or filtering, but you can send multiple, uh, the event through multiple uh, hops or multiple syncs. And the point of all this is, Knative gives you the basic infrastructure to define um, an eventing workflow orchestration type of mechanism, and nothing in Knative is event specific. Right? It doesn't understand it's getting events from GitHub versus GitLab versus anything else, or even the transport it comes in over. All it knows is after the adapter, it gets converted into a cloud event or HTTP, and then everything else can work magically, and cloud events is an integral part of that to enable things like the automatic routing and filtering and stuff like that. So in my mind, Cloud events was specifically is a perfect fit for something like Knative and this eventing infrastructure. It was like a perfect one-to-one -one match in my mind. And of course, because I work for IBM, I have to mention, we do include Knative with eventing support within our IBM cloud and the Kubernetes service. But really, this was about how great Knative is with cloud events. But you know, there we go. And then now I'm gonna hand it off to Vladimir just talking about PayPal's use of it. All right, how many of you have been using PayPal last month? Almost everybody, very good. So PayPal is very much like this airport demo. Instead of moving coffee and real goods, there is money flowing between uh, different areas. So <clears throat> I would like to show you a couple of examples of how do we uh, use uh, cloud events at PayPal. 
So as you know, uh, PayPal as a company uh, consists of a number of companies. There is a PayPal core, so-called. This is the usual PayPal that, uh, you know, but then there is a bunch of other companies like Zoom and Venmo and Braintree and uh, there, are, there are a number of others. And uh, we have seen um, as uh, PayPal is uh, acquiring these companies, they need to be integrated into the system. And uh, the systems have evolved over time in very different paths. So uh, the emergence of cloud events was kind of a natural place for us to try to organize all of these different teams and align on the um, uh, structure and uh, syntax of um, events that are exchanged between the systems. So originally, uh, the interaction started between uh, Zoom and uh, Venmo and PayPal. So the things that are happening in Zoom and Venmo that PayPal needs to know about are published as uh, events and that they are consumed by PayPal and then uh, there are various uh, processing and analytics that is happening there. But the other really interesting case is what you can see here on the uh, right hand side, the partners in green. Um, PayPal has a cooperation with a number of other financial institutions and uh, when something interesting happens there, uh, PayPal would like to know about that and then uh, process it. And um, the existence of cloud events was actually very useful there. It made it for easier onboarding of third-party companies because there was a standard and uh, the developer teams felt better about doing the integration when they knew that what they, the software that they are writing is compliant to some standard and that is something that they can reuse for possible future integrations. Currently, as you can see, the arrow goes from the partners to the PayPal. Um, um, and not necessarily the other way around. Uh, the other way around would mean that um, if something happens at PayPal, the other partner would need to know about that, and uh, we would fire a cloud event and they would um, react on that. Currently, this is not happening for one specific reason, and that is that most partners uh, have already well-established integrations with PayPal and that they are just using their already existing channels. But uh, for uh, new partners, this is definitely an interesting uh, option. So let's see what is happening inside. So um, when uh, you have a producer which is firing cloud events, they are going to do that uh, using um, HTTP, and then uh, the event will reach uh, PayPal. And um, the way how that works is the event will uh, reach our first uh, endpoint for um, authentication and authorization. This is the part of our standard PayPal gateway that is dealing with uh, different parties. So basically you have here the basic checks if uh, the other party is allowed to talk to us. Uh, then uh, there will be compliance. In the compliance section we are going to look into event. Uh, we are going to see uh, is this something that we expect. Uh, there will be the authorization. We are going to look if this party is supposed to send such event to us. So you have a more kind of semantic checks based on the relationship that we have with the partner. And then uh, there will be dispatch. I'll talk about dispatch in a moment. Uh, from there, uh, you have the event that is delivered to a variety of services that then actually consume the event and uh, do something with it. The integration of uh, functionalities in the gateway is basically happening in two areas. Uh, one is the API proxy, which performs a variety of uh, authentication, authorization, there is the essential routing that is happening there. And then we have a component that is doing the event uh, dispatching. That one is going to go inside the events. It is going to check that they are well formed according to the contract. Uh, they are going to decide on uh, authentication, oops, sorry, uh, authentication based on the contract. They are going to determine what needs to be done. And then from there, there are two things. Uh, one is uh, the traditional uh, synchronous delivery through HTTP. And you have also another type of delivery for asynchronous processing where the events are sent into the queues and then the handlers will be consuming the events uh, from there. And uh, that is the uh, current uh, aspect of integration of cloud events in the financial space. We have a couple of um, forthcoming areas uh, which are actually in the area of um, uh, software development lifecycle. In uh, that area, we have a number of tools that are supporting developers in automating variety of developer workflows. And um, one of the interesting avenues is uh, when something happens to an artifact in a software development uh, process, we fire event. This event would typically carry information about the artifact and what happened to that 
for example, that can be a result of security checks and attestations. And this event would then um, be stored into the artifact metadata repository, but also can trigger a variety of other flows. And um, that is, uh, that is uh, something uh, where we would typically use Kafka as a, as a transport. And uh, with this, uh, I would conclude this and um, uh, show you a couple of uh, resources. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so resources. Um, you can help. Uh, we, while we are done with Cloud Events core specification, we are not done with the code. Um, we are not done with extensions. We are not done with all the um, encodings. We are not necessarily done with transports, even though we um, would prefer to be. Um, but um, certainly we have a, a, we have a slot where you can go and put um, uh, you know, custom bindings for proprietary transports if you really must have one. Um, you can put them in there. So the, the core spec is locked. All the specifications that we have, um, all the bindings are effectively locked, but we are open for new things as well. Um, and uh, as I said, the, the, um, the, the codes, um, certainly contributors, uh, pull requests to make the SDKs better are, are certainly welcome. Um, and then we have work uh, overall in the serverless working group um, that um, will leverage cloud events, that will extend cloud events, like the subscription API that we just talked about, the uh, eventing catalog that are interested where we need to have um, helping hands. Um, you can, uh, the repo, um, if you go to the org uh, cloud events, uh, under spec, you will find the specification, um, including an uh, enormous amount of, uh, you should go and take a look at the, the, the closed pull requests. Um, if, you have a, if you have a day when you uh, want to learn a little bit of, about distributed systems history, um, because there's lots of very interesting discussions in there. Um, and then you find also the SDKs under this. So, that is what we had, and we have time left, do we? Yeah, we have tons of questions time. So. Go right ahead. There's a. You, you showed before how Azure uh, already starts accepting cloud events. Yes. But I think, uh, are, do, are there any other public clouds that work with cloud events? And Azure as well. You only allow pushing cloud events. What about the other way around? All of the Azure services that today emits to the, to the Azure functions, yes. can we intercept them ourselves with cloud events? Um, as, so, a, as a consumer, I mean. Um, yeah, so, as, as, so, in Azure, so Azure, if Azure functions bind to, binds to event grid, and you can, um, in an Azure function, you can get a cloud event. So that all works. So event grid is kind of the pop-up engine that is in the middle. All the Microsoft services that are currently publishing grid events are now speaking uh, Cloud Event 1.0. And you can go and hook up to, you can push it into a queue, you can push it into an Azure function, you can handle the, the event using the Azure function. And um, the... Not, not in, I cannot replace the Azure function. If I have, let's say, Knative. Of right? course you can. So I can so, run Knative and consume the events without using Azure functions? Yeah, absolutely. We, we okay. push into, into, into normal web. The, the, the sample that I just showed you? Any, any other public clouds that you know that are embracing cloud events? We're just using HTTP, ultimately. So, so it's just your code. that So you can go in and take any of the SDKs. If you're writing code in, in Go, if you're writing code in C Sharp, if you're writing code in Java, you take our SDK, and the SDK will basically take the request and, and crack it and, and give you the cloud event. OK, thank you. Any other, yeah. While I'm walking back here, um, I will point out at 425, the serverless working group is holding a session like this where we're going to talk more detail about what we're possibly going to work on next if you're interested in either hearing more about it or participating and trying to influence us. Yeah, so I wonder what's uh, maturity for the SDK for other languages. I know Go is, has, a, has the first class uh, support for uh, cloud events, but it seems like other languages are a little bit lagging behind, like Java and some other languages. Uh, well, the maturity level is that uh, we're doing what we can. <laughs> This is an open source project. If you find bugs, you can, uh, you can uh, file a PR and help. Um, no, but the, um, so I can, 
you know, the, the various teams would go and have to speak for themselves, but I think there is now, as we're now done with the spec, there now starts to be product tie-in. So I know that we are, so for Microsoft, we're using the C Sharp SDK also for ourselves, which means we're now kind of pushed to go and fix bugs that, that, that appear. Um, and we have already contributions, like there's a cloud events binding for ASP.NET Core that was built by the ASP.NET team um, that they just merged in. Um, so you'll see more contributions, and then, you know, code is as mature, it matures with age. Um, and uh, so you know, stuff, is, stuff is, is relatively early, um, but since it does a relatively constrained job, and that is mapping to and from, um, you know, transport messages, um, it's, uh, I think it's going to settle um, fairly quickly. So I have a question on uh, extensions. Uh, what is actually an extension, and what are the limitations of an extension and possibilities? What can it be? Extension is a spec, and it, the, an extension is a spec that defines attributes that you can also put under that cloud event. So generally, the rule is that you can go and make, um, you can add any attributes that you like to the outer to the outer level of a cloud event. There's no restrictions. We have some naming restrictions, so they must be all lowercase. They can't be, uh, and must only be letters. Um, but otherwise, there are effectively no restrictions. There can't be any complex types in, in, inside of them, so only values. If you have multiple values, you need to make multiple attributes. But otherwise, we don't put any restrictions. An extension is, um, in our parlance, is a specification that, that, that describes exactly what that extra attribute does so that multiple parties can implement it in the same way. So we have, for instance, an um, extension for a sequence number. We have um, extensions for tracing, um, for, open tra for the open tracing uh, standard, um, and some other extensions that um, effectively give you a common concept of that. And there's a rule inside of the spec that says if you see an attribute and you don't know what that attribute is, you must forward it. So it's, it's always guaranteed that if you drop an attribute into a cloud event somewhere over here and it goes through multiple hops, that will appear at the, uh, over on the other side through all the, uh, through all the conversions through uh, protocols, et cetera. So the extension, for an extension to work, it's sufficient for both ends to know it because the, all the middle infrastructure in the middle is obliged to go and carry, to carry that further. So it can be also metadata parameters, not only the data payload. Correct. So that's the, the so that's the intent. You can you can go and, and just as you would do with any messaging system, you can go and take well, out of your payload three, four, five important uh, metadata element, promote them out into the cloud event, so that then infrastructure, which operates on the cloud event uh, context attributes, um, will then be able to filter on them. So as you would do that with with JMS or with some other um, infrastructures. Any other questions? Uh, I, I can see the, the value of cloud events and uh, events on the outside, so integration events. Uh, do you know if there are any uh, event sourcing implementations who are also looking at providing a binding for internal use? Um, so, I, so since it's early, we just got done four weeks ago. Um, we will certainly start recommending to use cloud events also as the container format for um, uh, event hubs, so for our for our uh, event streaming system, and uh, also we already have a binding for Kafka, obviously, um, here, um, and um, it, it's it's a normalization of what an event is, and therefore, if you do event sourcing, then it's also a reasonable way to you to to use that for for event sourcing of any kind. Um, so I see that as a as a foundation for, you know, put in your event sourcing log, whatever, whatever, whether you use a time series database or a particular event store, or if you use Kafka, um, having a normalized event format is useful. So um, you'll see that. And we have, um, um, in the industry, we're, we're having some collaboration talks with um, standardization efforts in the industrial space. Um, where there's a lot of time series data and a lot of you know event information that then gets aggregated, stored, um, you know, hauled around, and um, that we're also recommending uh, in those talks that they also switch from their model to to cloud events. So yeah. Up. 
so you mentioned tracing uh, when it comes to, to uh, extensions. Would I use a custom extension if I want to, for example, associate a trace context, the, the W3C? Yeah, so the W3C context, for, for that specifically, we have the tracing extension. And we have, um, so, so you, would use, you would use, and some of the SDK, so the C Sharp SDK has that, I don't know what the status of the other ones is, but the C Sharp SDK has a first class um, serializer effectively for the well-known extensions, including the trace context. That you can then that you can then use, but you would, the trace context will propagate just like just like it does on on HTTP, but it does so at the at the event level. Now, there's a there's an interesting kind of duality which we've also been discussing. There is uh, because the question was, um, um, you know, do we map from the extension to the HTTP context, and we had this. There was a long, drawn-out discussion of whether we should and whether we shouldn't. We ended up with um, saying, no, we're not going to go and do any mapping, um, but we're going to let, let that extension, leave that extension alone. Effectively, you have, if you think about the transport levels, you start with a context um, at the HTTP sender, and then you, the, the message has been sent and has been transferred over to another party, and now you're going to do another hop. This transport stuff is all transport oriented and has kind of transport tracing and things can go wrong at the transport level. That's a different trace, trace path than the end-to-end -end relationship between the apps. And it's eff effectively your choice whether you want to root both of those contexts, the event per se and the HTTP transport in the, same, in the same context root. You can do that. And then you have two different paths you can basically pick from. So we, we chose not to do any magic but let you effectively put a context into the event, and so the event can do, the event uh, applications that are, that, that are handling the event can do tracing um, into one context, and then you can do that with, with or without the infrastructure in the middle that's up to you, because they are both then rooted in the same um, source context. So more of, that, more of that discussion you can read through the, uh, we've actually discussed it in the extension itself in the, in the doc. Any other questions? Oh, good. Uh, across a large and ill-disciplined company, um, thinking about how to stop multiple units emitting the same event type, uh, would the controls for that be basically around uh, the schema registry? So you would tag up events with a schema and control who owns that particular schema for the event? Um. I mean, what's, what stops kind of the, the, multiple units emitting, you know, a user-created event? Well, well what stops, what stops uh, uh, you know, three departments hijacking www.yourcompany.com? <laughs> so there, is, there are, there are um, there's always naming, and, and, and naming rules and, and ways to go and create a resource graph uh, across the system. And decisions are made about you know, who owns which domain, who owns which sub, uh, sub site of your corporate, uh, corporate site. So that is effectively the same problem. But what we did in, in cloud events for the type, the suggestion is that it is used for event types, you use reverse DNS, um, which means and it's the same thing with like, how can I make sure that, not, that the, the other team over there doesn't publish the same package with the same name you know, for Java.net, whatever. Um, on our internal repository, right? They have a name, and that's the name that they use. So eventing, event here is the same thing. You use, you know, com dot Microsoft dot, and then you know, team name, whatever, and they can go and create those events. So it, it's so it's effectively centered around the team, or better, the service that you build. That's 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 the 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 general notion that we have. I tend to think of it as a self-correcting problem. He'll stop talking to somebody or getting their events if they don't adhere to the rules yeah. that, that you laid out. That's right. It'll buff itself out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, another one here. So uh, we have a protocol right now that where we the imp one important aspect of it is that we link the events together in a chain of events. Uh, is that something you have th thought of, or is that something coming that we can create a chain of of events referencing each other? Um, every event, well, so how do you reference those? We have uh, IDs now, UUIDs, as I think you have as well, yep. and we reference them through the UUIDs. Yeah, and you can do that here too. There's, there's nothing stopping you. But that would be in the data payload then, right? That would be the payload, yes. Yep. I mean, there's no, 
I don't know how to think about that, how to think about that, that uh, mechanism and how that correlation ought to be, ought to work. Because what are you referring to? Are you referring to a store or what are you referring to? Are you doing correlation? An event. Hmm? event. Hmm? Another event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, how, wh but how, is that, how is that evaluated, that, that, sort, of, that sort of relationship? What is that, why is that, what is that for? To, visual, to, to provide a chain of, ha of events happening in a system. Yeah, what is it? Ah, uh, yeah, we have different types of these events, uh, these links. I mean, the, the link has a type on it. It's not just a, a, a UUID, it's a type on it as well. Okay. Depending on what event type you have right now, you can have a type of link that points to another thing, another that, event. And, and I think that's a perfect case for accessibility. Because, because it seems like from your, this might be something that's fairly custom or, or in, your, in your particular model that you have. And so that's what extensibility is for. But if you, have a, if you want to make a case um, that that's something that everybody should, should be doing and should be using, then you know, propose an extension. Yeah, actually, we had very long discussions around correlation IDs. Yes. And we ended up not doing them exactly because what Clemens said. There are so many different reasons for the correlation. It would seem like it would be a endless possible things and, and degree on the semantics, and it just seemed like an entirely different ball of wax. And we thought, like Clemens said, let it start out as an extension. If it becomes so popular that everybody has this particular correlation idea and with a very well-defined meaning, we could add it to the specification yeah. later. It, it would always be optional anyway, and that the same thing as an extension. So it would just be formalizing the name so that everybody knows it, they don't have to create their own name for it. But we're very open to those kind of things. It's just like security, oh my gosh, do you really want to tackle this and force it to take three years kind of thing? Yeah, yeah um, I have a question about uh, documentation, actually. So um, one of the things that I like about uh, REST APIs is that we have, um, we have um, nowadays an agreed upon open API spec format that we can use to describe the entire API and know what's possible and know uh, what the relevant data types are and so on and so forth. Um, have there been discussions within the serverless working group around developing a similar way of, of uh, presenting? So let's say I'm um, you know, Azure um, Event Hub and um, or, or let's say that I'm somebody that wants to um, you know, consume events from a, a particular source. Um, have there been discussions around a way to um, to advertise the the event types and the event um, you know schemas and so on and so forth that, that that are available from that particular source, and I suppose that the same could be said on the um, on the consumer side as well. Um, yes, yesterday, so we had a, we had a meeting yesterday about uh, you know future directions and the ca event catalog, together with the subscription mechanism, is something that that came up. Um, and um, as, as something that people would want to work on. Um, and Klaus also had, had that on his, in his slides. Um, so that's certainly one of the areas. We're going to have a, we're gonna have a um, discussion about this in, on the regular meetings um, and then basically make a decision on what we're going to work on next. Um, and uh, that's one of the areas that uh, we'll go and tackle next. Now, um, it'll be a little different from what OpenAPI is, because OpenAPI ultimately describes a, a contract for a relatively constrained surface area, um, and an event, event metadata store and description store needs to be a little bit different because you have events flowing into all kinds of directions, um, so you can't really model the flow in that way. Um, but you need to still need to have some semblance of a schema or at least pointers to schemas in a place where you can go and say, this place emits the following um, um, events. So that's something that we, that certainly several, several uh, participants are motivated to do and we'll have to go and figure out what we're gonna do next together because you know, keeping that group together is, uh, um, is the thing we need to do and not everybody uh, does that as a full-time job. Um, so therefore, we need to go and you know, pick and choose what we can do, but that's certainly one of those areas which is interesting. So Clemens, you, you might want to comment on this as well, but with the, all of the questions around the extensions, the way I think about the extensions is that you only put things in there needed for routing decisions. How do you move that event uh, further along the pipeline that you have and 
make sure that you keep all of the other data in your event type such that when it gets there, you can process it there. Promoting things from, from the event into the extension uh, can needlessly bloat that extension, but also disassociates the two. So just make sure that you understand the distinction between that. But Clemens, yeah. Yeah, feel I, free to comment as well. I, I agree. You would, the, the reason to promote data from, promote out from the event core event data into the cloud event context attributes is there so that infrastructure can see it. Um, so we're, we're uh, you know, you've seen the exact example of Knative, you've seen the example of Azure Event Grid, um, and uh, you know, SAP is building um, infrastructure pieces as well. And those infrastructure pieces are built such that they um, you know, han can handle cloud events generically. And um, you know, depends on what the capabilities are and how far they can filter on things that are not just source and type. Um, but you know, it, it makes no sense to go and promote something out if there is no code that will go and act on it. And that code that will act on it should be code that you haven't written. So everything that you need just for the last dispatch st stage where you can already know what's inside of that event, you can look inside of the event. But generic infrastructure can't afford to look into inside of your event data because it doesn't know what that is. It doesn't know your encoding, it doesn't know your schema, it doesn't, and it's actually compute intensive to go and go through that data. Um, so it can't afford that. So anything that you want to show external infrastructure, go and write a rule to go and route things left or right, um, that should go in there. Um, I have a quick question in regards to subjects. So currently, you, you only allow for like zero or one. Was there any thought given to allowing um, multiple subjects? Like let's say uh, for your blob, I'm creating a file, having the subject being the file name and also possibly the user who created the file for cases where there is more complex information where you want to filter on instead of just a simple string matching. So uh, we made it a string. Um, the subject is freeform string. You can put anything you like in there, and you control completely um, um, uh, what the shape of that is. Um, again, and this plays back exactly to the prior point, um, an event router like, like EventGrid, that can do operations on the subject and on the source, and we have a prefix match and a postfix match, for instance. Um, and, and some may have some regex matching. Um, but if you put something that's super complicated into the source, the source might, or the subject, the subject might not be useful for that purpose. So, if you need, if you need to have further, if need to further distinguish during dispatch time, then that makes sense uh, to put that into the event data. The subject is really just for uh, making the decision. Like, so I'll give you an example for the for the file store, right? Um, if you want to distinguish by file extension, you put the file name in there, and then you're going to say JPEGs go here, raw CR2 go here, GIF go here. Um, so you would basically go in and make that distinction. You can go in that from the routing perspective, but if you want to go more differentiated, um, then you know, cramming that all in that one subject field is probably not the best idea. But if you have an, an intermediary, you know, and now this goes into, you know, features of, of infrastructure um, that can go and you know, filter on um, additional attributes. You can go and add an additional attribute and have the data in there so it can be cleanly filtered. Right? So EventGrid, for instance, allows you to filter on, on additional properties. Any other questions? You want to ask one, Simon? No? <laughs> Anyone else? Right. We've exhausted the audience. Yeah. They're we almost use our time too, <laughs> uh, which is which is rather amazing for that we actually filled one and a half hours. That's astonishing. All right. Well, um, thank you very much for coming. I hope that was uh, uh, instructive and helpful and informative. And I can only encourage you to um, first uh, use it, second evangelize it, third come and uh, help. Thank you. <laughs>